Hi, I'm Jenny Shampo, the director of the Book of Mormon Art Catalog, and we're here with Benjamin Keogh from Scotland. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Good to be here. Yeah, thanks. Um, so Benjamin is a PhD candidate in systematic and historical theology at the University of St. Andrews, and he's working on a project focused on questions related to the atonement. Today, we're looking at the scriptures in 1 Nephi 6 through 10, uh, which includes Lehi's dream in 1 Nephi 8. And the artwork is based on Lehi's dream. It's by J. Kirk Richards, and it's called Pulling Up the Iron Rod. Uh, he did this in 2020. It's a painting. Um, Benjamin, in most of Lehi's dream art, we tend to see Lehi and his family surrounded by all the symbols from the dream. So like a tree and a path and the iron rod and a river and a mist and a building and a field. There's all these different symbols kind of crowded into it. How does this artwork differ from those more traditional depictions? Who do we see here? What's what's going on in this image? So yeah, the, obviously Kirk's uh, painting doesn't have a number of these traditional images that we see. And for me, the most striking difference is what he's done with the rod. Mm -hmm. uh, and compared to the, the role of the rod in the text, I think that the rod has a bit of an outsized role um, in our kind of cultural milieu. And uh, we sing songs about it, and we talk about the rod as if we hold on to the rod. It's the thing that's going to keep us close to the church. Uh, and in artistic depictions, generally the rod is aimed straight at the tree. Mm. Whereas in Kirk, um, it's going in front of the tree from one side to the other. Um, and I think uh, that that is, it's, and in that way, it's kind of detached from the tree. Uh, and so why I think that helps us, that's, for me, that's the most striking difference between the, this painting and traditional paintings, or usual paintings. And I think it helps us get something meaningful in the text, because in the text there are four sets or four groups of people who make it to the tree. There's Lehi, then there's Sariah, Sam, and Nephi, and there's a group called Others uh, in verse 24, and then in verse 30 there's this group called Other Multitudes. And of those four, only two, so 50% of them, use the rod to get to the tree. Um, and it's these last two groups, Lehi, Sariah, Sam, and Nephi, they don't use it. And of those two who use the rod to get to the tree, only one of them stays at the tree. And so we have these four groups who make it to the tree. Um, three of them stay there. But of those three, only one used the rod to get there. Um, and the only group that don't stick about at the tree have used the rod to get there. <clears throat> so to, to me, clearly, um, the rod is not the be-all and the end-all of getting to and sticking at the tree, uh, as far as the text is, is concerned. So that suggests something's going on. And mm -hmm. I think Kirk depicts that really nicely with his rod going in front of the tree. Yeah, I've, I've never seen it done like this either with the rod coming in front of the tree. And the people, they look sort of timeless to me. I don't know that they're particular individuals from First Nephi 8. What what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think that the, um, the anonymity gives them a kind of an every man or an every woman quality. Yeah. Uh, and so read ourselves into it or we can read at any particular time or any particular place into it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's helpful. Mm -hmm. I I love the just visually the way the figures are backlit by this brilliant tree behind them. Um I just think it's very striking. Um yeah, yeah. So Benjamin, you and I, um, along with Joseph Spencer, just co-edited a book that's just come out called Approaching the Tree, Interpreting First Nephi 8. Um, this is the artwork that we featured on the cover of the book. And um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you felt like the symbolism of this piece relates to the book project. Um, yeah, sure. I think there's... Um... 
kind of two answers or one answer in two parts. Um, and one is that the the project that was inspired by um, really this book here, a little visual aid. Um, so this is Lawrence Kushner's God was in this place and I, I did not know. Um, and here he's interacting with just that one verse um, that Jacob speaks when he wakes up from having the dream of the ladder which reaches mm -hmm. to heaven. Um, and there he interacts with that verse in conversation with the rabbis and provides seven different interpretations of that one verse. Um, and those interpretations convincingly interpret the verse, but you know they, they're different um, and they cannot be reconciled. <laughs> and so that's why we have seven readings in our book. Um, and the idea is um, that if we're going to take scripture seriously as a text that is written by humans, but accepted and approved by God as God's word, then that means um, that what God has to say through that word is not univocal. Um, that it becomes, that because scripture is a living word from a living God, it can speak to the reader from and to the reader's context. Uh, and because it is not theologically prescriptive, it becomes this theologically generative thing where a different or even competing readings can work together to shine a light on the inexhaustible word that is God. Uh, um, I think the painting captures that perfectly, that scripture is not an answer key. Um, yeah, that's that's wonderful. I really love the symbolism of this piece. How, like you said, it shows them really having to heft the rod. Like they're really having to work at it. It's not easy, and they're not just holding to it, but they're holding it up. And in some senses, it feels kind of like an individual project. Like they're each working on their own, but at the same time, they're working together. And there's a sense that it's this community of people lifting this rod together that brings them to the tree um and i think there's a nice symbolism there and then you know yeah. what we did in the book um was this a similar kind of idea of bringing together some scholars and artists to each grapple with these scriptures um the, the word of god and and interpret it um and show how it applies in our lives. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I really like that. But, uh, there's, we all have to work on it individually, but no one individual alone can lift the rod. It yeah. It's community. Yeah. To, to get where we need to go. So building on that a little bit, um, and you mentioned the book, um, is it Kushner? That wrote Kushner, that book. Yeah, love yeah. Yeah. So why, just to step back a little bit, why do you think it's important to consider a variety of theological or artistic approaches to scripture? Yeah, um, I do think it's important, which is why we've done the book. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think both the writing and the art are important. Um, and, and one reason for that is, uh, there's a, a great German theologian around the time of the war, Second World War, his name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, and he said that because Jesus is this fusion of divinity and humanity that we can't really understand, that all we're left with, all we're really able to do is ask, who is Jesus? Who is he? Um, and he says that every generation must ask that question. So it's not just who is Jesus, but who is Jesus today? Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason that every generation must ask that question is because no one generation can answer it definitively. Uh, the needs of each generation is, is different. And no one generation can answer it differently, not because who Jesus is changes, but because who Jesus is is inexhaustible. And so if Jesus is inexhaustible, then theological variety is necessarily going to bubble up when one comes into conversation with Jesus. Um, Jesus has to be able to, if Jesus is the saviour of the world, 
Jesus has to be able to save the world at any time and at any place and with any person. But I think another one reason why art in particular, I think is is so necessary, um, might come out of um, the account in Genesis where creation is depicted as a speech act of God, that mm -hmm. God speaks, and what happens is something appears that we can see. Mm -hmm. um, and and that is to take Kirk's painting, you know, if we if we take seriously the idea that scripture is the word of God, um, and God has spoken, and now Kirk has provided something that we can see. Um, when we write, you know, we can do things with our mind, but having that visual image um, does something different yeah. and provides a witness to God that, that words cannot provide. Yeah. I I felt like working on this book with you and um, seeing the new artwork from the nine artists in the book helped me think about the passage in First Nephi 8 in ways that I hadn't really reflected on before. Um, it was interesting how each artist shows a slightly different piece of the scripture to focus on um, or just a different emphasis on, on the message or meaning there. So what do you, can you share your personal reaction to this particular artwork or to, or to Lehi's dream in general? Um, yeah. So I, I, I do really like, um, I like Kirk's piece. I like the message behind it that we've been talking about um, and my own reading of the dream focuses on the relationships in which Lehi is involved mm. uh, and, and wants to argue that the dream is all, is all about Lehi and about Lehi's relationships uh, and one of the <clears throat> one of the things that happens in the dream is that um, Lehi continually loses sight of things and of people uh, and when Lehi when uh, when Lehi loses sight of things and of people, those people particularly are, are described as lost. So when some when mm -hmm. somebody is lost in the dream, it's because Lehi can no longer see them. Hmm. Uh, and one of the things that we've done is we've asked each of the people who wrote the essays, the interpretations, to conclude with a reflection on what that reading of the dream says about God. Yeah. Um, and, and I think because Lehi is this finite human who can only see so far, then then things get lost. Uh, but we, that's not the case with God. God doesn't lose us. We can never be lost to God. One of the, the things that the dream is trying to do is to show Lehi the ways in which he relates to people is different from the ways in which God relates to people. Mm. Uh, and so I think that with Kirk's painting again, this idea that it takes the community to lift the rod, um, that it, no, no one individual can come to God on their own. Mm. It takes the community. Um, and God will... No, no one individual, no one community can be lost to God. God is continually inviting and enticing us towards God. And together, we can lift the rod and come. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And thanks for joining us today all the way from Scotland. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs>